Today we're going to talk about the digestive system. There's a nice animation here that I'd like to show you, but when I'm recording on YouTube, YouTube doesn't allow external links to be recorded and displayed. So I'll list some of these animations separately within our lecture folder. So the digestive system. A key function of the digestive system is to take the food that we eat this all looks very tasty. And by passing it through the digestive tract and exposing it to different enzymes and secretions within the digestive tract, we're able to release the energy found in the bonds between the atoms that make up the different types of food. So here we can see the chemistry behind what's in these foods. And the job of the digestive tract is to break the bonds of these food products and release that energy and use that energy to make new things in the body and to drive our metabolism. So when you look at the parts of the digestive system, the GI tract, another name for that is the alimentary canal, we have a couple of different structures here to, to look at. Um, the major GI tract starts with the mouth, goes to the pharynx, which we know is the throat, then food is directed directly to this esophagus, then to the stomach, to the small intestine, to the large intestine, and then out the anus, the anal opening. So that's the GI tract. And then there's three accessory organs which help with digestion, but food does not pass through them. So they don't contain a hollow wall with smooth muscle forcing the food through them like the digestive tract does. These accessory organs have ducts leading from them to the duodenum where they secrete their contents to help with digestion. And we'll talk about the liver, the pancreas, and the gallbladder separately and what their specific digestive function is. But these structures all are parts of the tract which have smooth muscle and they propel food through the digestive tract and there are sphincters which help keep the food moving forward and controls the forward movement of food. So we have sphincters at the top and bottom of the esophagus called the upper and lower esophageal sphincter. You may have heard of that if you've ever had or heard of someone who has gastric um, esophageal reflux disease or GERD or acid reflux, that's the lower esophageal sphincter here that connects to the stomach, sometimes is weakened over time and the acidic stomach contents start to work its way up the esophagus and it causes what we know as heartburn. Because the esophagus lies behind the heart, some people confuse those symptoms with a heart attack, but it's always best to get that checked out and to treat it with an antacid to make sure that it's not truly a heart attack. So um, that's the upper and lower esophageal sphincters. They're, the upper is basically at the top of the esophagus, and then the lower is at the bottom of the esophagus. They're both under involuntary control, because once we swallow food, it makes its way down the esophagus to the stomach without any more voluntary control. So then we have sphincters at the bottom of the stomach called the pyloric sphincter, you'll recall, from lab. And then at the end of the ileum, starting with the large intestine, we have the ileocecal valve. So those are all passageways that connect the different parts of the GI tract together. And then at the anus, we have the internal anal sphincter and the external anal sphincter. The external anal sphincter is the only sphincter that is made of skeletal muscle and is under voluntary control because we control when we want to have a bowel movement. So that's the only um, sphincter within the GI tract that has voluntary control and is made of skeletal muscle rather than smooth muscle. So when we look at the functions of the GI tract, a key word when we're looking at wave-like smooth muscle contraction that moves food forward through the digestive tract is called peristalsis. So peristalsis is a wave-like movement of the smooth muscle that pushes food forward through the tract. And it's a very uh, important process. And it's very, um, uh, what's the word, intense and strong uh, when peristalsis is um, working properly. And even when it's working improperly, maybe you have felt the effects of reverse peristalsis before. And that's what vomiting is. Vomiting is peristalsis 
in the other direction and it's very intense and um, smooth muscle should not be underestimated in its strength. But um, vomiting can happen when a person has ingested toxins in the body. For example, my son, when he was young, uh, drank some soap because it smelled like strawberries and it wasn't long after that that he started to vomit. And when I called poison control, they said soap is irritating to the stomach and vomiting would happen naturally. And it did. But toxins, um, too much alcohol, overstretching the stomach with food can cause reverse peristalsis and vomiting, and also illness. You know, if a person has a, a, a gastrointestinal illness, the stomach bug, that can cause inflammation of the stomach and um, large intestine, small intestine, and cause vomiting. So anyway, this um, important process of peristalsis moves food through the digestive tract. Then uh, as that food is moved through, different secretions occur from the small intestine, the stomach, the accessory organs of the pancreas, the gallbladder and the liver, they all help to lubricate, liquefy, digest the food. And then that digestion further continues a bit with some mechanical digestion. The stomach moves the food back and forth with strong muscular contractions, and that exposes it to the hydrochloric acid that's present there, and digestion continues. And then it moves to the small intestine where the where the nutrients are absorbed. So as the enzymes break down these chemical structures and releasing the energy from the bonds, they're then absorbed by the cells that line the small intestine. And then lastly, the large intestine is in charge of elimination. So when you look at these um, processes of digestion, it seems like it would just be under the control of the digestive organs themselves. But actually, there's a phase of digestion which occurs with the help of the brain. That's called the cephalic phase of digestion. Cephalic being spelled C-E-P-H-A-L-I-C. The cephalic phase is the thinking phase of digestion. That's when we think about food, we see food, we smell food. That's when sometimes you'll notice your mouth starts to water. That's the brain getting the digestive tract ready for food. So it promotes digestion just by thinking, seeing, smelling food. That's called the cephalic phase. So although the digestive tract has a lot of nervous connections within itself to promote digestion, the brain can also play an important role. And it also plays a role in how we overeat, how we make bad food choices, because the brain likes pleasure. And the pleasure centers of the brain will seek out foods that provide those pleasures. So it's really a matter of willpower of not letting the brain 100% 100% control our digestion. digestion. So anyway, this absorption occurs in the um, simple columnar cells of the digestive tract, and then from there into the capillaries and off to the rest of the body. So we know that digestion begins in the mouth because of this wonderful enzyme that is found in saliva, which is called amylase. Amylase can break down starch, so carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, can be broken down by saliva in the mouth. Proteins cannot be broken down in the mouth, nor can fats, but carbohydrates that contain starch can be broken down with the help of amylase. And it's really important that we not underestimate the value of saliva. If you have a patient that's on a feeding tube and doesn't use their mouth for digestion, they really are um, at risk for bacterial infection because our saliva contains IgA antibodies and lysosomes to help prevent infection. And that watery mucus also helps moisten the mouth and prevent bacteria from causing tooth decay. So if we have a patient on a feeding tube, they're not going to produce produce much saliva because they're not using the action of their mouth and the digestive processes that begin there, that we really have to give them good oral care. Very, very important that we moisten the mouth and that we clean and brush the teeth so we don't get infection in the mouth, which could lead to aspiration pneumonia 
and hospitalization and death. Very um, common problem in nursing homes as people get older. So that saliva is also contains mucus, which helps, again, to lubricate food as we swallow it and um, keeps the mouth moist as well. But these, um, this amylase is really important for digestion, and that's where, where food begins its digestive process if it's a starch or a carbohydrate. So then we get to the next part of the digestive tract, and the throat is the common passageway for both food and air. That's the, the pharynx. So as we get to the bottom of the pharynx, food is directed to the esophagus and away from the airways. So it's a common passageway. And then once we get to the top of the larynx here, food is directed down the esophagus away from the airways. And again, the esophagus has an upper and lower sphincter that are not under voluntary control. They are made up of smooth muscle. And the job of the esophagus is not to digest or absorb any food, but just to transport it, just to take it from the pharynx, from the throat, and put it into the stomach. And then once it's in the stomach, the job of the stomach is to mix that food, and the stomach can stretch with the help of these wrinkles that help it to get larger, that it can hold about a gallon of food. But the job of the stomach then is to move this food back and forth, called mechanical digestion, just with the action of the contractions of the stomach. And then within the walls of the stomach are these gastric pits. And what lines these pits are a variety of different cells that have a bunch uh, several different secretions. Some of the secretions near the top of these pits is mucus, and mucus is meant to protect and lubricate the digestive tract. Very, very important for protection against ulcers and to lubricate food and allow it to pass more freely through the tract. Parietal cells line the tract. They're shown in blue here. They produce hydrochloric acid. And the function of hydrochloric acid in our digestive tract is to help us break down proteins. It also helps to fight infection and uh, reduce the bacteria in the foods that we eat. It also reduces the pH, and certain enzymes act at certain pHs. So hydrochloric acid, being an acid, reduces the pH of the stomach contents, contents and again, fights infection and helps with protein digestion because there's another cell called the chief cells. They're found in purple here. The chief cells secrete an enzyme called, or a substance called pepsinogen. But pepsinogen can't do anything until it's converted chemically to another substance called pepsin. So pepsin breaks down proteins. So the stomach can help with protein digestion with the help of pepsin. But pepsinogen has to be converted to pepsin. And that's another function of hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid helps convert pepsinogen to pepsin. And once we have pepsin, then we can, that enzyme breaks down proteins into their different amino acids. So lots of really, really important secretions here of the stomach. The parietal cells these blue cells that secrete hydrochloric acid, they also secrete another substance called intrinsic factor. The function of intrinsic factor, factor is to help us to absorb vitamin B12 from the foods that we eat. And it's really important that we have vitamin B12 in our bloodstream because that is necessary for making red blood cells. So if a person does not have good intrinsic factor secretion in their stomach, they will not be able to absorb vitamin B12, and as a result of that, they will not have good red blood cell production, and that sets them up for anemia. And the specific name of the type of anemia that is caused by low intrinsic factor and thus low vitamin B12 is called pernicious anemia. Now, you don't need to know that term specifically for our test, but I'm just mentioning it here because it's something that's very unique to the stomach and intrinsic factor. So another job of the stomach is to, uh, like I said, with the help of these um, 
contractions, intense contra contractions of the stomach, is to produce this substance which we call chyme. It looks like chyme, C-H-Y-M-E, but the C-H makes a hard sound, a hard K sound, so chyme. It's just liquid food. So the longer food is in our stomach, the more liquid it becomes. So if you've ever had your dog or cat, unfortunately, throw up on the carpet, you've seen the difference between recently eaten food versus chyme, which is liquid and absorbs into your carpet and makes a little bit more of a mess, right? Otherwise, the food just is in a, in a pile of solid food if they just threw up after eating food. So this chyme is liquid and it goes in tablespoons at a time into the first part of the small intestine through the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum. The duodenum is the first part of the small intestine here. So the stomach makes this chyme, the longer it's in there, and then just tablespoons at a time enters into the duodenum through the pyloric sphincter. So when you think of the word chyme, you're thinking of the stomach. That's its job, is to make that liquid food contents because that is more easily acted upon by the by the enzymes that the, this chyme will come in contact with in the small intestine. So the small intestine has these finger-like extensions called villi, and that increases the surface area for absorption to occur. And we can see all these different cells that line the villi, and these, many of them secrete mucus, but also different enzymes. Lots and lots of different enzymes are secreted by the small intestine. So when you talk about the small intestine, its job is digestion via the help of these enzymes and absorption to the bloodstream. So here we can see the blood vessels. As the food is absorbed by these cells, it enters into the lymphatics. That's the green vessels here. And we can see there's capillaries that it's absorbed into the blood and taken away to the rest of the body. So major site of absorption digestion and absorption occurs in the small intestine. And most of the digestion occurs in the first part called the duodenum. That's this shorter portion here, the first, po first part of the small intestine. And then a lot of absorption occurs from the, in the jejunum and then a little bit more in the ileum. But by the time we get down to the ileum, the bacterial counts are up and most of that food is digested, but it's still in a liquid form, ready to enter into the large intestine via the ileocecal valve. So again, mucus is produced by both the stomach and the small intestine. Its job is to protect and lubricate. And then all these lovely digestive enzymes are produced by those cells of the small intestine. Peptidases break down proteins, nucleases break down nucle nucleic acids, and these disaccharidases break down the sugars, disaccharides like sucrose. <clears throat> so then we get to the accessory organs. The liver is a major accessory organ of the digestive tract. The liver has many different functions, but the major digestive function of the liver is bile production. The, the number one reason for bile is to break down fats. So when we say emulsify fats, we're saying that it breaks down fats and releases them into fatty acids and glycerol because the fats that we eat are mostly in the form of triglycerides and bile helps to uh, begin that process of breaking down those fats and releasing the fatty acids and glycerol to be reassembled as other products in the body that are useful for metabolism and life in general. So there's other functions of the liver that are important that you'll learn about um, when we get to the different body systems into more detail, but a big one is detoxification. We know that um, alcohol is metabolized by the liver and people who ingest a lot of alcohol end, end up having liver disease. And we know that the liver is also responsible for making many of those important proteins that we find in the plasma. Albumin, fibrinogen for clotting, globulins, these are antibodies. Heparin is a blood thinner. 
and then factors for clotting the blood so and that work together with fibrinogen. And albumin is important for maintaining our blood volume and um, our blood pressure. We'll talk more about that when you get into um, advanced A&P. So this bile production is really, really important. It's the major digestive function of the, litter, of the liver. So the, the liver produces uh, most of the bile that's used in digestion, but a small amount of it is sent to the gallbladder for storage. So the gallbladder doesn't make bile, it simply stores and concentrates it for use in digestion. And if sometimes if we have too high of a fat diet, too much cholesterol in the diet, or rapid weight loss causing excess fat to enter the bloodstream as fat is burned, um, we can end up with gallstones. And as a result, gallstones will plug the ducts that empty the gallbladder. And as a result of that, a person might need to get their gallbladder removed. The pancreas is another accessory organ of the digestive tract. Its job, its digestive job, is to produce digestive enzymes. And a number one enzyme that the pancreas produces is lipase. And lipase, if you look at the root word there, lipid, lipase, breaks down fats as well. So bile breaks down fats and lipase breaks down fats. And again, breaking them down into fatty acids and glycerol. So they also produce a pancreatic juice. And that pancreatic juice help, further helps with digestion. So those are the digestive functions of the pancreas, are making those enzymes, which then are that will enter the pancreatic duct and go to the common bile duct and then enter the duodenum where they'll do their job it's in the duodenum. And then the pancreatic juice also enters the pancreatic duct, goes to the common bile duct, and then into the duodenum where it acts for digestion. So the endocrine function of the pancreas, which means these, this insulin and glucagon does not go to the duodenum, these go to the blood and they act throughout the body to control blood sugar. So we know that glucagon raises blood sugar between meals. So if you don't eat breakfast and you run off to class or work and your blood sugar doesn't cr crash, you can thank your pancreas for secreting glucagon to keep your blood sugar stable between meals. Insulin, on the other hand, does the opposite. It lowers blood sugar after meals. So if you have a proper working pancreas, then you have sufficient insulin production. If you eat a sugary meal, you'll have insulin production from your pancreas going to the blood, and that will lower your blood sugar. So they act opposite of one another. Glucagon works between meals, and insulin works to lower blood sugar after meals. So glucagon in some young women is not secreted in uh, good amounts, and as a result, they tend to have what we call hypoglycemia, which means if, if, if you go without food, you tend to get kind of shaky and sweaty, and you need to eat more often than the average person. That means you probably don't have great glucagon secretion. Sometimes if you eat sugary meals, a sugary breakfast first thing in the morning, that can cause a blood sugar crash. Um, as your insulin is absorbed and you end up with a very low blood sugar because of a very high sugar meal, um, that can be a sign of low glucagon secretion or too much insulin secretion with an extra sugary meal. So it helps sometimes to have a little protein in, in your breakfast meal to help stabilize your blood sugar and not have too much insulin secretion and then having a blood sugar crash. So the pancreas then, again, it has several different functions. Some of them are endocrine, which means goes to the blood, and that's the, the insulin and glucagon, and the digestive functions, secretions that go to the ducts from the pancreas to the duodenum are those digestive enzymes and that pancreatic juice. So when you get to the end, end of the digestive tract, we hit the large intestine. The large intestine, remember, has this appendix that comes off right at the beginning of the large intestine that sometimes can get clogged with stool and become inflamed and infected and eventually burst, releasing stool into the abdominal cavities. So that's a very serious situation. It needs to be dealt with with IV antibiotics and, and removal of the appendix. But the large intestine has several different functions. A big one is to reabsorb water from the feces. 
So we, if we move our bowels too quickly, that's diarrhea, and we've lost water that was meant to be reabsorbed and sent back to the blood. So a person can be dehydrated if they have diarrhea too long. And that's one of the major causes of death in children in third world countries is chronic diarrhea that can't be controlled because of foodborne illnesses and, and poor quality water and poor access to health care. Those children die of dehydration just from the diarrhea. So when we look at other functions of the large intestine, so it's to absorb water. That's an important one. You can also reabsorb some electrolytes like bicarbonate ion. That's important. Also, um, sodium ions. So when we um, have diarrhea, we're at risk for electrolyte loss. You can lose bicarbonate and sodium through diarrhea. So it's important to replace those with like a Gatorade or some other Pedialyte if it's children or even adults drink Pedialyte. But it's important to release, uh, replace water and electrolytes that might be lost via um, diarrhea. So anyway, we had this mucus production. We already talked about that. That helps protect and lubricate the tract. And um, we have bacteria in the large intestine that helps um, with regularity and reduces the amount of gas produced as we're as we're digesting foods. But if a person has a has a high preservative, high carbohydrate, and high fat diet, gas in the digestive tract can build up and cause you know foul smelling gas, and that's a sign of poor gut health. And sometimes probiotics can help get those bacteria back in check, like Florigen. Or maybe you've heard of Activia, the yogurt. Sometimes those can help people that have gas and constipation due to just uh, poor bacterial flora in the large intestine. And stress can also play a role in that as well, especially nowadays with everybody working so many hours and probably not eating very well, not drinking enough water. Constipation can be a real problem. So we talked about different things that can um, stimulate digestion. Like I said, the cephalic phase of digestion is thinking, seeing, smelling food. Um, when we look at uh, factors that cause bowel movements, once food enters the stomach and stretches the stomach wall, that can cause digestion. And that can also stimulate the large intestine to make a bowel movement. So as the stomach is stretched, that stimulus acts on the large intestine and stimulates a, the urge to have a bowel movement. We call that the gastrocolic reflex. And that is listed here on this slide. The gastrocolic reflex is initiated by stretch of the stomach wall. And that stimulates the bowels to move stool out of the body. So that's an important uh, reflex in children. If you've ever gone to a nice restaurant and sat down and they just deliver your steak and then your five-year-old just finished their chicken nuggets and they're ready to go have a bowel movement in the bathroom while your steak gets cold at the table, right? So that's kids for you. And that's an active stomach ga uh, gastrocolic reflex, which is working efficiently to promote bowel movements. And some of you younger students out there that are still in your teens or early 20s, you may find that your gastrocolic reflex is also intact and you find that you have to have a bowel movement shortly after eating. But as we get older, it's more the presence of, of this chyme in the lower uh, digestive tract in the duodenum that stimulates uh, mass movements or stimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system like quiet activities and um, just relaxation will stimulate the bowels. So that's the gastrocolic reflex, stretch of the stomach causing the bowels to move feces and stimulate a bowel movement. So as we age, what do we get to look forward to? Well, there's less mucus in the respiratory tract, so there's less mucus as well in the digestive tract. And that causes um, an increased susceptibility to infections, food poisonings, and stomach ulcers, 
and cancers, so that we really need that good mucus protective layer to protect our digestive tract. And the activity of the digestive tract goes down. We see less peristalsis, less contractions of that smooth muscle. So people tend to have constipation and slower digestive processes. So they don't need to eat as much or as often as we age because this whole process of the peristalsis slows down. Also, the nerves of the tongue and nose for smell and taste become less um, sensitive. And as a result, people can't taste food that may be going bad. Um, the elderly sometimes won't, won't go to the grocery store very often, or they might have some salad dressing that's been in their refrigerator for a while that they don't eat as much, so they don't use up things like they used to. And they might have some food that's going spoiled, and they don't smell or taste that. They also may not smell a gas leak in their house if they left the kitchen stove on. So it's important that people have those alarms up to date that are working to alarm people if they have, you know, a gas leak in the house. Um, periodontal disease, that's of the teeth. So gum disease can happen um, as people age. Um, other problems, fecal incontinence, those sphincter, sphincters don't work as well. They become weakened. And with diarrhea, they can have leakage of stool. Diverticulosis is little pockets of the large intestine that become stretched and can burst and kind of like the appendix, but they're just little out pouchings of the large intestine that can weaken and then stool breaks through and gets into the abdominal cavity causing infection. Colon cancers are a big problem as we age and if we have Throughout our lifetime, a high-fat, high-preservative diet increases the risk for colon cancers, and that's why it's really important that people get their colonoscopies and, and to look for those signs and symptoms of colon cancer. So that concludes our discussion of the digestive system.